Chapter Seven of Weapons of Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Weapons of Mystery by Joseph Hocking. Chapter Seven. Drear Water Pond. I will not try to describe my walk back to Temple Hall or tell of the terrible sensations that I felt. Think, if you can, of my position. A young man of thirty, a slave to a deep designing villain, held fast in his power by some secret nervous or brain forces which he possessed. More than this, he had designs upon the woman I loved, while I was powerless, nay, worse than powerless, for he might make me do things which would be altogether opposed to what I believed right and true. When you realize this, you will be able to form some idea of how I felt. And yet, I was not altogether without hope. I felt that life and love of liberty were strong in me, and I determined that though I might be conquered, it should not be without a struggle. Arriving at the house, I saw Simon Slowden. He evidently had a message for me, for making a sign for me to stop. He quickly came to my side. "'Your nag is saddled, sir,' he said. I caught his meaning instantly. "'Which way did they go? And how long have they been gone?' I asked. "'They've gone to Drearwater Pond, Your Honor. Started about half an hour ago. Any message for me?' "'The governor told me, if I saw you, to tell you where they'd gone. Who went with Mr. Temple? Miss Gray and the other lady, Your Honor?' He had led out the horse by this time and I was preparing to mount it, when I saw that he had something more to communicate. "'What is it, Simon?' I said. He did not speak, but winked slyly at me, and then led the horse away from the stable-yard. As he did so, I saw Kaffar come away from one of the lads who was employed about the house. "'He's a spy, Your Honor, a regular Judas Iscariot. T'other chap's called Herod. Pity this one isn't called Judas.' They be a beautiful couple, Your Honor. He looked round again and then said, That murderin', wassilatin' villain is gone after him, Mr. Blake. He came back just after they'd gone and went ridin' after them like greased lightning. For a minute I was stunned. I thought I'd better tell ye, Your Honor, then you'd know how to act. I thanked Simon heartily. Then turning my horse's head towards Drearwater Pond, I galloped away. I had not gone far before I began to question the wisdom of what I was doing. Was I right in thus openly defying the man who possessed such a terrible power? It certainly seemed foolish, and yet I could not bear the idea of his being the companion of Gertrude Forrest. Besides, it might stagger him somewhat to find that his words had not frightened me. With this thought, I gave my horse the rein. He was a beautiful, high-blooded creature, and seemed to delight in making the snow crystals fly around him as he scampered over the frozen ground. I do not know the district at all, but I had been told in what direction Drearwater Pond lay, so I did not doubt that I should easily find them. When I came to the spot, however, those I hoped to find were nowhere to be seen, and so, guiding the horse up to the dark waters, I stood and looked at the little lake that bore such a somber name. It was indeed a dreary place. On one side was wild moorland, and on the other a plantation of firs edged the dismal pond. It might be about a quarter of a mile long, and perhaps one-sixth of a mile wide. There were no houses near, and the high road was some distance away. It was not an attractive place, for several reasons. The region was very drear, and moreover the place had a bad reputation. The pond was said to have no bottom while a murder having been committed on the moors near by the country people said that dark spirits of the dead were often seen to float over the drear waters in the silent night i stood at the edge of the water for some time then i quietly led my horse away around to the other side where dark fir trees made the scene if possible more gloomy than it would otherwise have been i had not been there long before i heard voices and looking up I saw the party walking towards me. Evidently they had fastened their horses in the near distance, and were now seeking to better enjoy themselves by walking. As they came near me, 
I made a slight noise which drew their attention. Certainly I ought to have felt flattered by their greeting, especially by that of Miss Forrest. We thought you'd been bewitched, Mr. Blake, said Miss Gray, after a few trivial remarks had been passed. Perhaps I was, I said, looking at Voltaire. He stared at me as if in wonder, and a curious light played in his eyes. He had uttered no word when he saw me, but he gave indications of his astonishment. Well, continued Miss Gray, this is the proper place to be bewitched. Mr. Temple had been telling some strange stories about it. What was it, Mr. Temple? A red hand appears from the water, and whoever sees it will be led to commit murder? Oh, there are dozens of stories about the place, said Tom. Indeed, there is scarcely a youth or maiden who will be seen here after dark. Why? asked Voltaire suddenly. Oh, as I said just now, it is reported to be haunted. But more than that, the pond is said to have an evil power. Some say that if anyone sees the place for the first time alone, his hands will be red with blood before a month passes away. Then that will refer to me, I said. But surely such nonsense is not believed in now. These things are not nonsense, said Voltaire. Earth and heaven are full of occult forces. I paid no further attention to the subject at the time, but this conversation came back to me with terrible force in the after days. For a while we chatted on ordinary subjects, and then remounting our horses we prepared to ride back. During this time I had felt entirely free from any of the strange influences I have described, and I began to wonder at it, especially so as Miss Forrest had voluntarily come to my side and we had galloped away together. We took a roundabout road to Temple Hall, and so were longer together, and again I was happy. I thought you were not coming, she said. What in the world drew you away so suddenly? I tried to tell her, but I could not. Every time I began to speak of the influence Voltaire had exerted, I was seemingly tongue-tied. No words would come. I was very sorry, I said at length, but you did not want a companion. Mr. Voltaire came. Yes, he overtook us. Is he not a wonderful man? Yes, I said absently. I was so sorry you allowed yourself to be placed under his influence last night. Did you not hear me asking you to avoid having anything to do with him? Yes, I said. I am sorry. I was a coward. I do not understand him, she said. He fascinates while he repels. One almost hates him, and yet one is obliged to admire him. No one would want him as a friend, while to make him an enemy would be terrible. I could not help shuddering as she spoke. I had made him my enemy, and the thought was terrible. He does not like you, she went on. He did not like the way you regarded his magical story and his thought-reading. Were I you, I should have no further communications with him. I should politely ignore him. I watched her face as she spoke. Surely there was more than common interest betrayed in her voice. Surely that face showed an earnestness beyond the common interests of a passing acquaintance. I do not wish to have anything to do with him, I said. And might I also say something to you? Surely if a man should avoid him, a woman should do so a thousand times more. Promise me to have nothing to do with him. Avoid him as you would a pestilence. I spoke passionately, pleadingly. She turned her head to reply and I was bending my head so as not to miss a word, when the subtle power seized me. I did not wait for her reply, but turned my head in a different direction. Let us join the others, I stammered with difficulty, and rode away without waiting for her consent. She came up by my side presently, however, but there was a strange look on her face. Disappointment, astonishment, annoyance, and hauteur, all were expressed. I spoke not a word, however, I could not. A weight seemed to rest upon me. My free agency was gone. How do you know they are in this direction? She said at length. We have come a circuitous route. They surely are, I said. The words were dragged out of me as if by sheer force of another will, while I looked vacantly before me. Are you well, Mr. Blake? She asked again. You look strange. Well, well, I remember saying. Then we caught sight of three people riding. Hurrah! I cried. There they are. I could see I was surprising Miss Forrest more and more, but she did not speak again. 
pride and vexation seemed to overcome her other feelings and so silently we rode on together until we rejoined our companions ha justin cried tom we did not expect to see you just yet surely something's the matter oh no i replied when looking at herod voltaire i saw a ghastly smile wreathe his lips and then i felt my burden gone evidently by some strange power at which i had laughed he had again made me obey his will and when he had got me where he wanted me he allowed me to be free no sooner did i feel my freedom than i was nearly mad with rage i had been with the woman i wanted more than anything else to accompany we had been engaged in a conversation which was getting more and more interesting for me and then for no reason save this man's accursed power i had come back where i had no desire to be i set my teeth together and vowed to be free but looking again at voltaire's eyes my feelings underwent another revulsion i trembled like an aspen leaf i began to dread some terrible calamity before me stretched a dark future i seemed to see rivers of blood and over them floated awful creatures for a time i thought i was disembodied and in my new existence i did deeds too terrible to relate then i realized a new experience i feared voltaire with a terrible fear strange forms appeared to be emitted from his eyes while to me his form expanded and became terrible in its mien i knew i was there in a yorkshire road riding on a high-blooded horse i knew the woman i loved was near me and yet i was living a dual life it was not justin blake who was there but something else which was called justin blake and the feelings that possessed me were such as i had never dreamed of and yet i was able to think i was able to connect cause and effect indeed my brain was very active and i began to reason out why i should be so influenced and why i should act so strangely the truth was and i felt sure of it as i rode along i was partly mesmerized or hypnotized whatever men may please to call it partly i was master over my actions and partly i was under an influence which i could not resist strange it may appear but it is still true and so while one part of my being or self was realizing to a certain extent the circumstances by which i was surrounded the other enslaved part trembled and feared at some dreadful future and felt bound to do what it would fain resist this feeling possessed me till we arrived at temple hall when i felt free and as if by the wave of some magical wand justin blake was himself again instead of following the ladies into the house i followed the horses to the stables i thought i might see simon slowden who i was sure would be my friend and was watching kaffar closely but i could not catch sight of him herod voltaire came up to me however and hissed in my ear do you yield to my power now i answered almost mechanically no but you will he went on you dared to follow me to yonder lake but you found you could not ride alone with her how terrible it must be to have to obey the summons of the devil and so find out the truth that while two is company five is none i began to tremble again he fixed his terrible eye upon me and said slowly and distinctly justin blake resistance is useless i have spent years of my life in finding out the secrets of life by pure psychology i have obtained my power over you you are a weaker man than i weaker under ordinary circumstances you would be swayed by my will if i knew no more the mysteries of the mind than you because as a man i am superior to you superior in mind and in will force but by the knowledge i have mentioned i have made you my slave i felt the truth of his words he was a stronger man than i naturally while by his terrible power i was rendered entirely helpless still at that very moment the inherent obstinacy of my nature showed itself i am not your slave i said you are he said did you feel no strange influences coming back just now was not herod voltaire your master i was silent just so he answered with a smile and yet i wish to do you no harm but upon this i do insist you must leave temple hall you must allow me to woo and win miss gertrude forrest i never will i cried 
Then said he jeeringly, Your life must be ruined. You must be swept out of the way, and then, as I told you, I will take this dainty duck from you. I will press her rosy lips to mine, and— Stop! I cried. Not another word. And seizing him by the collar, I shook him furiously. Speak lightly of her, I continued, and I will thrash you like a dog, as well as that cur who follows at your heels. For a moment my will had seemed to gain the mastery over him. He stared at me blankly, but only for a moment, for soon his light eyes glittered, and then as Kaffar came up by his side, my strength was gone, my hands dropped by my side, and unheeding the cynical leer of the Egyptian or the terrible look of his friend, I walked into the house like one in a dream. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of Weapons of Mystery》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carl Henning《Weapons of Mystery》by Joseph Hawking《Chapter Eight — Darkness and Light — during the next few days there was but little to record. The party evidently forgot mesmerism and thought-reading, and seemingly enjoyed themselves without its assistance. The young men and women walked together, talked together, while the matrons looked complacently on. During the day there was hunting, skating, and riding, while at night there was storytelling, charades, games of various sorts, and dancing. Altogether it was a right old-fashioned, unconventional English country party, and day by day we got to enjoy ourselves more because we learned to know each other better. Perhaps I am using a wrong expression. I ought not to have said we. I cannot say that I enjoyed myself very much. My life was strange and disappointing. More than that, the calamities I dreaded did not take place, but the absence of those calamities brought me no satisfaction, and thus, while all the rest laughed and were joyful, I was solitary and sad. Once or twice I thought of leaving Temple Hall, but I could not bring myself to do so. I should be leaving the woman I was each day loving more and more to the man who knew no honor, no mercy, no manliness. During these days I was entirely free from Voltaire's influence, as free as I was before I saw him. He always spoke to me politely, and to a casual observer his demeanor towards me was very friendly. Kaffar, on the other hand, treated me very rudely. He often sought to turn a laugh against me. He even greeted me with a sneer. I took no notice of him, however, never replied to his insulting words, and this evidently maddened him. The truth was, I was afraid lest there should be some design in Voltaire's apparent friendliness and Kaffar's evident desire to arouse enmity, and so I determined to be on my guard. I was not so much surprised at my freedom from the influence he had exercised over me the day after I had placed myself under his power, and for a reason that was more than painful to me, Miss Forrest avoided ever meeting me alone, never spoke to me save in monosyllables, and was cold and haughty to me at all times. Many times had I seen her engaged in some playful conversation with some members of the party, but the moment I appeared on the scene her smile was gone, and, if opportunity occurred, she generally sought occasion to leave. Much as I loved her, I was too proud to ask a reason for this, and so, although we were so friendly on Christmas Day, we were exceedingly cold and distant when New Year's Eve came. This, as may be imagined, grieved me much, and as I saw Voltaire smile as he watched Miss Forrest repel any attempt of mine to converse with her, I began to wish I had never set my foot in Temple Hall. And yet I thought I might be useful to her yet, so I determined to remain in Yorkshire until she returned to London, and even then I hoped to be able to shield her from the designs which I was sure Voltaire still had. New Year's Day was cold and forbidding. 
The snow had gone and the ice had melted, but the raw, biting wind swept across moor and fen, forbidding the less robust part of the company to come away from the warm fires. I had come down as usual, and, entering the library, I found Miss Forrest seated. "'I wish you a happy new year, Miss Forrest,' I said. "'May it be the happiest year you have ever known.' She looked around the room as if she expected to see someone else present. Then, looking up at me, she said, with the happy look I love to see, "'And I heartily return your wish, Mr. Blake.' There was no coldness, no restraint in her voice. She spoke as if she was glad to see me, and wanted me to know it. Instantly a burden rolled away from my heart, and for a few minutes I was the happiest of men. Presently I heard voices at the library door, and immediately Miss Forrest's kindness and cheerfulness vanished, and those who entered the room must have fancied that I was annoying her with my company. I remained in the room a few minutes longer, but she was studiously cold and polite to me, so that when I made a pretense of going out to the stables to see a new horse Tom Temple had bought, I did so with a heavy heart. I had no sooner entered the stable yard than Simon Slowden appeared, and beckoned to me. "'I looked out for your honour all day yesterday,' he said, "'but you lay like a hare in a furze bush. "'Things is looking curious, your honour. "'Indeed, Simon, how? "'Can he come this year way a minute, Your Honor? "'Certainly,' I said, and followed him into a room over the stables. "'I did not like having confidence in this way, "'but my brain was confused, "'and I could not rid myself from the idea "'that some plot was being concocted against me. "'Simon looked around to make sure there were no eavesdroppers. "'Then he said, "'There's a ancient virgin there called Miss Staggles, "'ain't there, Mr. Blake?' there is. Why? It's my belief as how she's been a waccinated ten times, Your Honor. Why, Simon? Why, she's without blood or marrow, she is, and as for flesh, she ain't got none. Well, what for that? And not only that, he continued, without heeding my question, she ain't got a hands of tender feelings in her nature. In my opinion, sir, she's a witch, she is and I've got dealings with the devil. And what for all this? I said. Surely you haven't taken me up here to give me your impressions concerning Miss Staggles. Well, I have partly, Your Honor. The truth is, here he sunk his voice to a whisper, she's very thick with that woman with the Hinfidel's name. They're in league, sir. How do you know? They've been a promenadin' together nearly every day since Christmas. And when a feller like that air Walter goes a walking with a creature like that ancient virgin on his arm, then I think there must be something on board. But this is surely surmise, Simon. There's no reason why Miss Staggles and Mr. Voltaire may not walk together. There's more than surmise, sir. You know the plantation up behind the house, Mr. Blake? The fir plantation. Very well. Well, sir, the night afore last, I were up there. They're having a kind of Christmas tree in one of the Sunday schools over in the village tonight, and some of the teachers came to the governor and asked him for a tree to put some knick-knacks on. So he says to me, Simon, says he, Go up to the plantation and pull up a young fir tree, and then in the morning put it in the cart and take it over to the schoolroom. This was day afore yesterday, in the afternoon. I was busy just then, so I didn't go to the plantation till twas dusk. However, as you know, Your Honor, tis moonlight, so I didn't trouble. Well, I got a young fir tree, pulled up, and was just a going to light my pipe when I saw some figures a coming through the plantation towards a summer house that was put up about two years ago. So I lied, Luff. I believe I says that it's that infidel and the skinny virgin are walking together. They goes into the summer house, and then I creeps down and gets behind a tree, but close enough to the couple to hear every word. Sure enough, sir, I were right. It was the words and staggles in this air will tear. They seemed quarreling like when I come up, for sure she was saying, "'Tis no use, she never will. Nonsense,' says he. Give her time and poison her mind against that Blake, and she'll come round. 
I've done that, says she. I've told her that Mr. Blake is a regular male flirt, that he's had dozens of love affairs with girls, and besides that, I told her that her marked preference for him was being talked about. Yes, says Walter, and see how she's treated him since. True enough, says she, but it's made her no softer towards you. If she avoids him, she dislikes you. And do you think she cares about Blake, says he? I don't know, she replies. She never would tell me anything, and that's why I dislike her so. But for all that, she's no hypocrite. Well, what for that, he asks. I went to her room last night, and I began to tell her more about him and compare him to you. Well, says he. Well, she got into a temper and told me that she would not allow Mr. Blake's name to be associated with yours in her room. Then, sir, that heir willin' he swore like a trooper, and said he'd make you rue the day you were born. After that, they were silent for a little while, and then she says to him, I believe she knows what you are wanting to do, and has some idea of the influence you've exerted over him. She's as sharp as a lancet, and it's difficult to deceive her. If only that Blake hadn't come, he says, as if talking to himself. Yes, she says, but he has come, says she. But if he can be made to leave her and never speak to her again, will it not show to her that he's what you said he was, and thus turn her against him? I don't know. She's been cool enough to drive him away, said that air Miss Staggles. But if he leaves disgraced, proved to be a villain... A deceiver, a blackleg, or worse than that, while I show up as an angel of light? I don't know, she says. You're a wonderful man. You can do almost anything. You could charm even an angel. Well, you'll do your best for me, won't you? says he. You know I will, she says. But we must not be seen together like this, or they will suspect something. True, says he. But I want to know how things are going on. Then he stopped a minute, and a thought seemed to strike him. "'Miss Staggles, my friend,' he says. "'Watch her closely, and meet me here on New Year's Day, at five o'clock in the evening. It's dark then, and everybody will be indoors.' "'Then, Your Honor, they went away together, and I was on the lookout for you all day yesterday.' There was much in Simon's story to think about, and for a time all was mystery to me. One thing, however, I thought was clear. He had either found he could do no good by his mesmeric influences, or else he had lost them, and so he was working up some other scheme against me. I pondered long over the words, If he leaves disgraced, prove to be a villain, a deceiver, a blackleg, or worse than that, while I show up as an angel of light? Surely that meant a great deal. I must be on the watch. I must be as cunning as he. I did not like eavesdropping or playing the spy. And yet I felt there were times when it would be right to do so, and surely that time had come in my history. There was villainy to be unmasked. There was a true, innocent girl to be saved, while my reputation, happiness, and perhaps life were in danger. I determined I would meet Stratagem with stratagem. I would hear this conference in the wood that evening. I would seek to undeceive Miss Forrest, too, whose behavior was now explained. Accordingly, after a few more words with Simon, I wended my way back to the house again. I found Miss Forrest still in the library, together with Tom Temple and Edith Gray. All three looked up brightly at my entrance. We were just talking about you, Justin said Tom, as I joined them. I had been telling these ladies what a terrible woman avoider you have always been. Miss Forrest wouldn't believe me at first, but that story of your walking five miles alone rather than riding a carriage with some ladies has convinced her. I thought you had improved the first day or so after you came, but you seem to have fallen back into your old ways. Don't put the fault on me, Tom, I said. The fault has generally been with the ladies. The truth is, I'm not a ladies' man, and hence not liked by them. I have generally been put down as a kind of bore, I expect, and I've never taken the trouble to improve my reputation. 
"'Then you ought,' said Miss Gray, laughingly. "'It's a shame that you should be under such a ban, "'because if a man can't make himself pleasant to ladies, "'what can he do?' "'Well, I should like to turn over a new leaf,' I replied. "'But then I don't seem to please. "'I've no doubt my company is very tiring, "'and thus I must be left out in the cold.' "'Nonsense!' replied Tom. "'Let us have another ride this afternoon, "'and see whether you can't make Miss Forrest a pleasant companion.' "'If Miss Forrest would allow me, I should be delighted,' I said. "'I expected an excuse, such as a cold, a headache, or some previous engagement, "'especially as she had looked steadily into the fire while we had been talking. "'Instead of this, however, she frankly accepted my escort, "'and accordingly the ride was arranged.' Nothing of importance happened before we started. We had gone out quietly, and had attracted no notice, and rode away towards the ruins of an old castle which Tom thought we should like to visit. As I stated, it was a raw, cold day, but I did not feel the biting wind, or notice the weird desolation that was all around. I felt supremely happy as I rode by Miss Forrest's side. We had gone perhaps two miles from the house when we found ourselves separated from Tom Temple and Miss Gray, and we slackened our horses' speed to a walk. "'Have you thought my conduct strange since we last rode out together?' she said. "'I have indeed,' I replied bluntly, "'especially as I do not remember having done anything that should merit your evident dislike to me.' "'I owe you an apology,' she said. "'I have been very foolish, very unjust. "'I am very sorry.' "'But might I ask why you saw fit to change your conduct "'from friendliness to extreme aversion? "'I am almost ashamed to tell you, Mr. Blake, but I will. "'If there is one thing for which I have aversion and contempt, "'it is for flirting, coquetry, and the like. "'If there is any species of mankind that I despise, "'it is that of a flirt, a society man, a ladies' man.' "'And have I ever given evidence of belonging to that class, Miss Forrest?' "'No,' she replied, "'and that is why I am so ashamed of myself. "'But I listened to some foolish gossip "'about your boasting of your conquest with ladies and the like. "'I know I ought not to have listened to that, but I did. "'I am very sorry. Will you forgive me?' "'She said this frankly and without hesitation, "'yet I thought I saw a blush mount her cheek as she spoke.' "'If there is anything to forgive, I do forgive you,' I replied, "'especially as I despise that class of individuals as much as you. "'The vapid, dancing society mannequin is everywhere an object of contempt, "'while a society girl, as generally accepted, is not a whit more to my taste. "'I saw she was pleased at this, and I felt I loved her more than ever. "'Did she, I wondered, care anything for me?' Was there any vestige of interest in her heart beyond that which she felt for any passing acquaintance? Mr. Blake, she said, after pausing a second, do you remember what we were talking about that day when we last rode out together? We were talking of Mr. Voltaire, I said. Have you found out anything more about him? No, I have not. Is there any mystery connected with him? I think there is. I have an indistinct kind of feeling that both he and the Egyptian are deceivers, while I am sure that Mr. Voltaire is... is your enemy. I have no doubt he is, I said. She looked at me strangely. I had not been in Temple Hall two hours before that man had marked me as one that he would fain be rid of. Indeed, she said. Then if that is the case, you should listen to my advice. Have nothing to do with him. "'But I must have something to do with him, and with his friend, the Egyptian, as well.' "'Don't,' she said anxiously. "'The two work together, and are both cunning as serpents, I believe.' She continued after a pause, "'that the thought-reading and mesmerism were somehow designed to injure you. "'I think somehow they are acquainted with forces unknown to us, and will use them for evil.' "'Yes, I believe all that,' I said. "'then why must you have any dealings with them?' "'Because they will have dealings with me, "'because they are plotting against me, "'because there are forces over which I have no control, "'drawing me on.' 
But why will they have dealings with you? Why are they plotting against you? Because Voltaire knows that I love, with all my soul, the woman he wants to win for his wife. A curious look shot across her face. What was it? Love, astonishment, pain, vexation, or joy? I could not tell, but my tongue was unloosened. Do I annoy you, astonish you, Miss Forrest? I said. Forgive me if I do. I have been regarded as a woman-hater, a society avoider. That is because I never saw a woman in whom I was sufficiently interested to court her society. I have heard it said that such characters fall in love quickly, or not at all. The first day I saw you, I fell in love with you. I love you with all my soul. She looked at my face steadily, but did not speak a word. Voltaire has found out this, and he too wants you for his wife, so he has been trying, is trying, to drive me away from here. How, I cannot tell you, but what I have said is true. I spoke rapidly, passionately, and I saw that her face became alternately pale and red, but she did not reply. Am I bold to speak thus? I asked. I think I must be, for I have scarcely known you a week, but I cannot help it. My life is given up to you. If I could but know that my love were not in vain, if you could give me some word of hope. A beautiful look lit up her eyes. She opened her mouth to speak, when a voice shouted, Come, Justin, don't loiter so. We shall not get back in time for dinner if you do. It was Tom Temple who spoke, and a turn in the lane revealed him. To say I was sorry would be but to hint at my feelings but I could not hinder the turn things had taken, so we started our horses into a gallop, I hoping that soon another opportunity might occur for our being alone, when I trusted she would tell me what I desired to know. I do not know how I dared to make my confession of love, for certainly I had but little proof of her caring for me. If I hoped, it was almost without reason, and yet, as we galloped on, my heart beat right joyfully. Nothing of importance occurred during the ride. The castle we visited was grim and gray enough, but it was not the kind of afternoon when one could enjoy to the full such a place, so we were not long before we turned our horses' heads homeward. Time after time on our homeward journey did I contrive to be alone with Miss Forrest, but always in vain. She kept by the side of Edith Gray in spite of all my schemes to get her by mine. Her lips were compressed and her eyes had a strange look. I longed to know what she was thinking about, but her face revealed nothing. We came to the house at length, however, and then I hastened from her side to lift her from the saddle. Then my heart gave a great throb, for I thought she returned the pressure of my hand. Do be careful about that man, she said hurriedly, and then ran into the house. It was joy and light to me, I needed it in the dark days that came after. The stable boy had scarcely taken the horses when a thought struck me. I looked at my watch, and it was almost too dark for me to discern the time, but I saw, after some difficulty, that it wanted but a few minutes to five. In my joy I had forgotten my determination, but now I quickly made my way to the summer house that stood in the dark fir plantation. End of chapter 8《of Weapons of Mystery》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Weapons of Mystery》by Joseph Hocking Chapter 9 the hall ghost perhaps some of my readers may think i was doing wrong in determining to listen to the proposed conference between miss staggles and voltaire i do not offer any excuse however i felt that if this man was to be fought it must be by his own weapons such at any rate as i could use i remembered the terrible influence he had exercised over me 
the power of which might not yet be broken. I remembered Miss Forrest, too. Evidently this man was a villain, and wanted to make her his wife. To stop such an event, I would devote my life. Something important might be the result of such a conversation. I might here disclose the secret of his influence, and thereby discover the means whereby I could be free, and this freedom might, I hoped, make me his master. Anyhow, I went. The dark clouds which swept across the sky hid the pale rays of the moon, and clothed in black as I was, it would be difficult to see me amongst the dark tall trees. I hurried to the summer-house, for I wished to be there before they arrived. I was successful in this. When I came all was silent, so I got behind a large tree, which while it hid me from anyone entering the house, enabled me to be within earshot of anything that might be said especially so as the summer-house was a rustic affair and the sides by no means thick silently i waited for i should think half an hour then a woman came alone evidently she was cold for she stamped her feet against the wood floor with great vehemence minute after minute passed by still there was no third party and then i heard a low st you're late said the woman's voice which i recognized as miss staggles yes and we must not stay long. Why? Because I think we are watched. But why should we be watched? Surely no one perceives that we are suspicious parties. I cannot say. I only know I cannot stay long. Why again? I have much to think about, much to do, and I have much to tell you. I can guess it, I think, but I must know. Tell me quickly. He spoke peremptorily, as if he had a right to command, while she did not resent his dictatorial tones. They've been riding together again today. I guessed it. Bah! What a fool I've been. But there, that may mean nothing. But it does. It means a great deal. What? I believe that he's asked her to be his wife. In fact, I'm sure he has. Darkness and death, he has. And she? I hardly know. But as sure as we're alive, she likes him. How do you know this? I saw them come in from their ride, and so I guessed that they had become friendly again. Well? Well, I met her in the hall. She looked as happy as a girl could well look. I am a woman, so I began to put the two and two together. I determined to listen. I went upstairs to my room, which you know is close to Miss Gray's and Gertrude's. If you had known girls as long as I, you would know that they usually make friends and confidants of each other. I found this to be true in the present case. Gertrude had not been in their room above five minutes before Miss Gray came to the door and asked to come in. It was immediately opened, and she entered. And what then? I listened. Just so. I expected that. But what did you hear? I could not catch all they said. But I gathered that they had a delightful ride, that Mr. Blake had made a declaration of love to Gertrude. And her answer? I could not catch that. She spoke too low but I should think it was favorable, for there was a great deal of whispering, and after a while I heard something about that dreadful man being Mr. Blake's enemy. Ah, how did they know that? I gathered that Mr. Blake told her. Look here, Herod Voltaire, you are playing a losing game. I, playing a losing game, do not fear. I'll win, I'll win, or, or, here he paused, as if a thought struck him. Why don't you get an influence over her? as you did over Blake. Then you could manage easily. I cannot. I tried. Her nature is not susceptible. Besides, even if I got such a power, I could not use it. You cannot force love, and the very nature of the case would make such a thing impossible. Stay. You know Miss Forrest well, don't you? Her education and her disposition? I've known her long enough. Well, tell me whether I am correct in my estimate of her character. If I am, I do not fear. She's very clear-headed, sharp, and clever, a hater of humbug, a despiser of Kant. True enough, but what's this got to do with the matter? In spite of this, however, went on Voltaire, without heeding Miss Staggles' query, she has a great deal of romance in her nature, has a strong love for mystery, so much so that she is in some things a trifle superstitious. I can't say as to that, but I should think you are correct. 
then she's a young lady of very strong likes and dislikes but at bottom is of a very affectionate nature affectionate to nearly everyone but me muttered miss staggles she is intensely proud as lucifer interrupted miss staggles this is her great weakness went on voltaire her pride will overcome her judgment and because of it she will do things for which she will afterwards be sorry is this true true to the letter you must be a wizard herod voltaire or you couldn't have summed up her disposition so correctly her sense of honor is very great she would sacrifice her happiness to do what was thought to be honorable i believe she would then my path is marked out said he savagely from that time i could catch nothing of what was said although they conversed for five minutes at least but it was in whispers so low that i could not catch a word presently they got up and went away while i with aching head and fast beating heart tried to think what to do everything was mystery i could not see a step before me why should miss staggles be so willing to help herod voltaire and what were the designs in his mind what was his purpose in getting at a correct estimate of miss forrest's character i went to the house pondering these things in my mind and arriving there heard the hall clock strike the quarter from which i knew it was a quarter past six we were to dine at seven that day and as i did not usually make an elaborate toilette i knew i had plenty of time i felt i could not go in for a few minutes my brain seemed on fire i turned to take a walk towards the park gates when i heard a footstep and turning saw simon slowden can you give me ten minutes before dinner sir he said i dare say i said he led me into the room in which we had spoken together before there's something wrong your honor he said in a low voice how do you know why well, that there egyptian have been dogging me all day he got a hinkling as how we're trying to match him and reckons as how i'm your friend besides today when i see you ride off with the young lady i thinks to myself there's no knowing what time he'll be back i know what tis your honor to have been in the arms of weenus myself and knows as how an hour slips away like a minute so as there were no tellin' if you'd get back to the summer-house to-night at five o'clock i thought i'd just toddle up myself but twas no go i sees they two willins a talkin together and when that air voltaire went off by himself the other took pon himself to keep with me i tried to get him off but twas no use he stuck to me like a limpet to a rock perhaps it was all fancy simon no fancy in me but a lot of judgment fact sir I begun to think for the first time as ow some things in the Bible ain't true in the Psalms of Solomon It reads resist the devil and he'll go away howlin Well, I've resisted that ere devil and he wouldn't go away till he'd knowed as how he'd played his little game and Simon looked very solemn indeed Is that all Simon all your honor? Tisn't much you think but to me it looks mighty suspicious as I said to my sweetheart when I see her a huggin and a kissin the coachman I went away laughing, but my heart was still heavy. Try as I would, I could not dispel the fancy that soon something terrible would happen. During dinner, Kaffar made himself very disagreeable. This was something unusual, as he was generally very bland and polite. But tonight he was so cantankerous that I fancied he must have been drinking. To me he was especially insulting, and went so far as to hint that I, unlike other Englishmen, was a coward. That I hadn't courage to resist a man manfully, but would act towards an enemy in a cunning serpent-like way This was not the first occasion on which he had sought to pick a quarrel with me, and I felt like resenting it I desisted however as there were ladies present and went on quietly talking to my neighbor as if he hadn't spoken This roused his ire more when I saw that Voltaire watched me with his light glittering eye as if expecting a scene after dinner this being new year's day we passed a more than usually merry time stories were told old ballads were sung while roger d coverley was danced in downright earnest by most of those who were present by midnight however the old hall was silent each of us had repaired to his room and most i expect were quietly asleep when a terrible scream was heard after which there were shouts for help and hysterical cries 
the sound seemed to come from the direction of the servants hall and quickly putting on some clothes i hurried thither i soon found that the noise had roused the whole household and so when i arrived i found a number of guests had gathered together on looking into the room i saw that the housekeeper was lying in a swoon one of the servants was in hysterics while simon slowden who was in the room and the page boy looked as white as sheets and were trembling evidently with fear what does this mean asked tom temple a little angrily at this the housekeeper became conscious and said in a hoarse whisper is she gone what who do you mean asked tom the hall lady she said fearfully we are all friends here said tom and i thought i detected an amount of anxiety in his voice this appeared to assure the housekeeper who got up and tried to collect her thoughts we all waited anxiously for her to speak i have stayed up late mr temple she said to tom in order to arrange somewhat for the party you propose giving on thursday the work had got behind and so i asked two or three of the servants to assist me she stopped here as if at a loss how to proceed go on mrs richards we want to know all surely there must be something terrible to cause you all to arouse us in this way i'll tell you as well as i can said the housekeeper but i can hardly bear to think about it twas about one o'clock and we were all very busy when we heard a noise in the corridor outside the door naturally we turned to look when the door opened and something entered well what some servant walking in her sleep no sir said mrs richards in awful tones it looked like a woman very tall and she had a long white shroud around her and on it were spots of blood in her hand she carried a long knife which was also covered with blood while the hand which held it was red she came closer to us she went on with a shudder and then stopped lifting that terrible knife in the air i cannot remember any more for i was so terribly frightened i gave an awful scream and then i suppose i fainted the story was told with many interruptions many pauses many cries and i saw that the faces of those around were blanched with fear do you know what it did simon said tom turning to that worthy after it lifted its knife in the air she went away with a wail like said simon slowly she opened the door and went out and then i tried to go to the door and when i got there there was nothing that is you looked into the passage simon nodded and what did you think she was like like the hall ghost as i've heard so much about said simon the hall ghost cried the ladies hysterically what does that mean mr temple i do not think tom should have encouraged their superstition by telling them but he did he was excited and scarcely knew what was best to do they say that like other old houses temple hall has its ghost he said that she usually appears on new year's night if the year is to be good to those within at the time she comes with flowers and dressed in gay attire if bad she's clothed in black if there's to be death for any one she wears a shroud but it's all nonsense you know said tom uneasily and she comes in a shroud said the servant who had been in hysterics and there were spots of blood upon it and that means that the one who dies will be murdered and there was a knife in her hand and that means that twill be done by a knife it would be impossible to describe the effect this girl's words made she made the ghost very real to many and the calamity which she was supposed to foretell seemed certain to come to pass i looked at gertrude forrest and ethel gray who wrapped in their dressing gowns stood side by side and i saw that both of them were terribly moved voltaire and kaffar were both there but they uttered no word they too seemed to believe in the reality of the apparition after a great deal of questioning on the part of the lady guests and many soothing replies on the part of the men something like quietness was at length restored and many of the braver ones began to return to their rooms until tom and i were left alone in the servants hall we again questioned the servants but with the same result and then we went quietly upstairs arriving at the landing we saw miss forrest and miss gray leaving mrs temple at the door of her room tom hurried to miss gray and took her by the hand while i nothing loath spoke to miss forrest there's surely some trick in this i said to her 
I felt her hand tremble in mine as she spoke. I do not know. It seems terribly real, and I have heard of such strange things. But you're not afraid. If you are, I shall be up all night and will be so happy to help you. I thought I felt a gentle pressure of her hand, but I was not sure. But I know that her look made me very happy as she, together with Edith Gray, entered her room a few minutes after. When they had gone, I said to Tom, I'm not going to bed tonight. No, said Tom. Well, I'll stay up with you. This ghost affair is nonsense, Tom. I hope you will not find any valuables gone tomorrow. Real or not, said Tom gaily, I'm glad it came. How's that? It gave me the nerve to pop the question, he replied. I told my little girl just now, for she is mine now, that she wanted a strong man to protect such a weak little darling. And she? She said that she knew of no one whom she liked that cared enough for her to protect her. So I told her I did. And then, well, what followed was perfectly satisfactory. I congratulated him on his audacity, and then we spent the night in wandering about the first floor of the house, trying to find the ghost, but in vain. And when the morning came, and we all tried to laugh at the ghost, I felt that there was a deep, sinister meaning in it all, and wondered what the end would be. End of chapter 9《Of Weapons of Mystery》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — Weapons of Mystery by Joseph Hocking Chapter 10 The Coming of the Night Directly after breakfast I went away alone. I wanted to get rid of an awful weight which oppressed me. I walked rapidly, for the morning was cold. I had scarcely reached the park gates, however, when a hand touched me, and I turned and saw Kaffar. I hope your solitary walk is pleasant, he said, revealing his white teeth. Thank you, I replied coldly. I thought he was going to leave me, but he kept close by my side, as if he wanted to say something. I did not encourage him to speak, however. I walked rapidly on in silence. Temple Hall is a curious place, he said. Very, I replied. So different from Egypt. Ah, so different. There the skies are bright. The trees are always green. There the golden sand hills stretch away. The palm trees wave. The Nile sweeps majestic. There the cold winds scarcely ever blow, and the people's hearts are warm. I suppose so. There are mysteries there, as in Temple Hall, Mr. Blake, but mysteries are sometimes of human origin. As he said this, he leered up into my face, as if to read my thoughts. But I governed my features pretty well, and thus, I think, deceived him. Perhaps you know this, he said. No, I replied, I am connected with no mysteries. Not with the appearance of a ghost last night? I looked at him in astonishment. The insinuation was so far from true that for the moment I was too surprised to speak. He gave a fierce, savage laugh, and clapped his hands close against my face. I knew I was right, he said, and then before I had time to reply, he turned on his heel and walked away. Things were indeed taking curious turns, and I wondered what would happen next. What motive, I asked, could Kaffar have in connecting me with the ghost? And what was the plot which was being concocted? There in the broad daylight the apparition seemed very unreal. The servants alone in the hall at midnight, perhaps talking about the traditional ghost, could easily have frightened themselves into the belief that they had seen it. Or perhaps one of their fellow servants sought to play them a trick, and ran away when they saw what they had done. I would sift a little deeper. I immediately retraced my steps to the house, where meeting Tom, I asked him to let me have Simon Slowden and a couple of dogs, as I wanted to shoot a few rabbits. This was easily arranged, and soon after, Simon and I were together, away on the open moors, there was no fear of eavesdroppers, no one could hear what we said. Simon, I said, after some time, have you thought any more of the wonderful ghost that you saw last night? Instantly his face turned pale, and he shuddered as if in fear. At any rate, 
The ghost was real to him. Your Honor, he said, I don't feel as if I can talk about her. I played in Hamlet, Your Honor, along with Octavius Bumpus's traveling theater, and I can nail a made-up living ghost in a minute. But this ghost didn't look made up. There was no blood, Your Honor. She looked as if she'd have been waccinated forty times. And were the movements of her legs and arms natural? No giants, Master Blake. She looked like a wooden figure without proper giants. Perhaps she had a few wire pins in her anatomy, but no giants proper. So you believe in this ghost? Can't help it, Your Honor. Simon, I don't. There's some deep-laid scheme on foot somewhere, and I think I can guess who's working it. Simon started. You don't think that air waxinatin' some namblifyin' willin have got the thing in and— I didn't speak, but looked keenly at him. At first he did nothing but stare vacantly, but presently a look of intelligence flashed into his eyes. Then he gave a shrug, as if he was disgusted with himself, which was followed by an expression of grim determination. Master Blake, he said solemnly, it's that waxinatin' process as have done it. Simon Slowden couldn't have been such a nincompoop if he hadn't been waccinated against whooping cough, measles, and smallpox. Your Honor, he continued, after I were waccinated, I broke out in a kind of rash all over, and that air rash must have robbed me of my senses, but I'm blowed. There, I can't say fair nor that. Why, what do you think? I daren't tell you, Your Honor, for fear I'll make another mistake. I thought, sir, as it would take a hangle with black wings to nick me like this ear, and now I've been done by somebody. But it's the waccinatin', Your Honor. It's the waccination. In the Proverbs of Job we read, Fool and his money soon parted. And so we can see how true the teaching is today. But what is to be done, Simon? Simon shook his head, and Ned said solemnly, I'm away from my bairn, sir. I thought when I were done the last time it should be the last time. It were in this way, sir. I was in the doctor's service, as waccinated me. Says he, when he done, Simon, you'll never have smallpox now. Think not, says I. Never, says he. And when Susan, the housemaid, heard it, she says, I'm so glad, Simon. Then says I, Susan, when people are married, they're converted into one flesh. That's scripture. You get married to me, says I, and you'll be kept free from smallpox without going through this year willifying process. With that, she looks at me and says, You are purty. I'll try you for three months. If you don't get smallpox in that time, why then, we'll talk about it. So I says, Say yes at once, Susan. The doctor says I can't get it, so there's no sort of fear. I were young and simple then, and thou doctors never made a mistake. Well, sir, in two months more, I were down with smallpox, and when I got up again, I were a sight to behold. As soon as I were fit to be seen, I went to Susan to get a mite of comfort. And then I see her a courtin' with a coachman, and I says to myself, Simon Slowden, I says, this year's the last time you must ever be taken in. And now I'm right mad that I should have been licked in this year way. I couldn't help laughing at Simon's story, in spite of my heavy heart. And so I asked him what the doctor said when he found vaccination a failure. Sent me off without a character, sir, he replied grimly. Said he couldn't keep a servant as would a livin' advertisement as how his pet obby were a failure. And so I always say as how, as how waccination is my ruin. It ruined my blood and weakened my brain. Still, continued Simon with a sly look, I reckon as how I'll be a match for that er doubly waccinated ghost as frightened me so. I could get nothing more from him. He had formed some notion about the apparition which he would not divulge. So we devoted our attention to sport and after frightening a good many rabbits, we returned to the hall. Nothing of importance happened through the day, except an inquiry which Tom made among the servants. Each declared they were entirely ignorant as to the appearance of the ghost, and all were evidently too frightened to doubt the truth of their statement. Thus, when evening came, nothing was known of it. Kafar did not speak to me from the time I had seen him in the morning to dinner-time, and evidently avoided me. Voltaire, on the contrary, was unusually bland and smiling. He was pleasant and agreeable to everyone, especially so to me. After dinner we all found our way to the drawing-room, when the usual singing, flirting, and dancing program was carried out. Suddenly, however, there was comparative silence. One voice only was heard, 
and that was the Egyptians. Yes, he was saying, I am what is called a superstitious man. I do believe in dreams, visions, and returned spirits of the dead. But, ah, I do not believe in made-up ghosts. Oh, you cold-blooded English people, don't mistake the impulsive Egyptian. Don't accuse him of lack of faith in the unseen. So much do I believe in it that sometimes I long to be with those who have gone. But, bah, the ghost last night was to deceive, to frighten, got up by some villain for a purpose, and I can guess who he is. This is serious, said Tom Temple. I have inquired of the servants who all assure me of their entire ignorance of the matter, and I cannot think that any of my guests would assume the person of the traditional ghost for no other purpose than to frighten the housekeeper and two or three servants. I am by no means superstitious, but I do not see how I can trace it to human origin. I cannot see why any guest should assume the person of the traditional ghost, but some men have deep designing minds. They are like clever draught players. They see a half dozen moves ahead, and so do that which to a novice appears meaningless and absurd. Then I heard another voice, one that caused my heart to beat wildly. It was Gertrude Forrest's. Mr. Kaffar says he can guess who the person is who has personated this ghost, she said. I think it fair to every guest that he should speak out. I would not like to say, he said insultingly, perchance I should wound your tender feelings too deeply. Mr. Kaffar will remember he's speaking to a lady, I'm sure, said Tom Temple. Pardon me, said Kaffar excitedly. I forgot I was in England where men are the slaves of the ladies. With us it is different. We speak and they obey. I forgot I was not in Egypt. I have done very wrong. I implore the lady's pardon. I see no meaning in your words, said Miss Forrest quietly. Therefore, I see nothing to forgive. Ah, I live again. A heavy load is gone from my heart. I have not merited the lady's displeasure. Still, I think it right, if you have grounds for suspecting anyone, that we should know, said a voice. Otherwise, someone may be wrongly accused. Do not ask me, said Kaffar. Ask Mr. Blake. Instantly all eyes were turned on me, and do as I might, I could not help an uncomfortable flush rising in my face. I do not know what Mr. Kaffar means, I replied. I am as ignorant as to the origin of the ghost as he is, perhaps more so. Instantly Kaffar leaped from his chair and came up to me, his hands clenched, his black eyes gleaming, his teeth set together as if in a terrible rage. You are a liar and a villain, he screamed. Ah, remember this morning I accused him, gentlemen, of being connected with this ghost only today, and he flushed guiltily and was silent. He looked like a Judas who betrayed his master. Quietly, please, I replied. You did come to me this morning with some foolish jargon about my being connected with last night's affair, but I was so surprised by the absurdity and foolishness of such a thing that I could not answer you before you ran away. You hear? shrieked the Egyptian. So surprised was he? If he was, it was because I had found him out. This man is mad, I said. Surely he ought to be shut up. Mad am I, he shrieked. Yes, and you are a liar and a coward and a villain. You are engaged in a fiendish plot. You are deceiving an innocent lady. Ah, I spurn you, spit upon you. Mr. Kaffar, said Tom Temple, really, this cannot be allowed. You must remember, you are among gentlemen and ladies. Please act accordingly. Ladies there are. Gentlemen there are, shrieked the Egyptian. But he, pointing at me, is no gentleman. He is at once a viper, a villain, and a coward. I leave this house. I renounce pleasant society. I leave this country forever. But before I go, I would like to fight hand to hand with that giant who, ah, he stood close to me and spat at me. There, he cried, and then he struck me in the face with all his strength. Instantly I leaped to my feet. This insult was too great. I could scarcely restrain from striking him to the ground. I mastered myself, however, and so did not touch him. I leave this house, he said wildly. Herod, send on my baggage to Cairo. But turning to me, you I challenge. You with your big body and trained arms. But, bah, you dare and fight. You are a mooning coward. He rushed out of the room as he spoke, and a minute later I heard the hall door slammed with vehemence. At that moment I became possessed of a terrible passion. I seemed to be mad. 
I longed to avenge the insults that had been offered. I looked around the room, and all seemed astounded at the behavior of the Egyptian, save Voltaire, who was apologizing in profuse terms for his friend. As I looked at his terrible eyes, my passion became greater, and I felt I could not govern myself if I stayed in this room. I think someone came up to me and congratulated me on my coolness in dealing with the man who had insulted me so, but I did not listen. I could not. An overmastering impulse laid hold of me to follow the Egyptian, and I dimly remember going into the hall and out into the silent night. I knew the probability was that I should be followed, but I did not know where to go. But I seemed to hear voices all around me uttering the words, Drear Water Pond. With that I started running, with all my might, knowing not where, yet dimly remembering that I had gone the road before. Then all memory and consciousness ceased. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of Weapons of Mystery》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nolan Fout. Weapons of Mystery by Joseph Hawking. Chapter Eleven Dark Dreams and Night Shadows. I suppose I must have gone on blindly for some time, for when I again became conscious I stood beside a river, while tall trees waved their leafless branches overhead. Strange noises filled the air. Sometimes wailing sounds were wafted to me, which presently changed into hisses, until it seemed as if a thousand serpents were creeping all around me. The waters of the river looked black, while above me were weird, fantastic forms leaping in the stillness of the night. No words were spoken, no language was uttered save that of wailing and hissing, and that somehow was indistinct, as if it existed in fancy and not in reality. By and by, however, I heard a voice. Onward, it said, and I became unconscious. Again I realized my existence in a vague, shadowy way. I stood beneath the ruined walls of an eastern temple. Huge columns arose in the air, surmounted by colossal architraves, while the ponderous stones of which the temple was built were covered with lichen. Large gray lizards crawled in and out among the crevices of the rocks, and seemed to laugh as they sported amidst what was once the expression of a great religious system, but which was now terrible in its weird desolation. By and by, the great building seemed to assume its original shape, and became inhabited by white-robed priests, who ministered to the people who came to worship. I watched eagerly, but they faded away, leaving nothing save the feeling that a terrible presence filled the place. I heard a noise behind. I turned and saw Kaffir, his black eyes shining, while in his hand he held a gleaming knife. He lifted it above his head as if to strike, but I had the strength of ten men, and I hurled him from me. He looked at me with a savage leer. Onward, said a distant voice. The temple vanished, and with it all my realization of life, save a vague fancy that I was moving somewhere, I knew not where. I stood by a well-remembered spot. I was by the side of Drearwater Pond. Around me was a stretch of common land, on which grew heather and firs. In front of me were noiseless waters, a dismal sight at the best of times, but awful as I saw them, across the pond in the near distance loomed the dark fir trees. No sound broke the stillness of the night. The wind had gone to rest, the moon shone dimly from behind the misty clouds. I stood alone. 
each minute my surroundings became more real i recognized more clearly the objects which had struck me during my first visit while the stories which had been told came back to me with terrible distinctness i remembered how it had been said that the pond had no bottom and that it was haunted by the spirits of those who had been murdered the story of its evil influence came back to me and in my bewildered condition i wondered whether there was not some truth in what had been said what was that the waters moved distinctly moved near to where i stood and from their dark depths something appeared i could not at first tell what what could it be a monster or frightful man the ghost of some murdered man or woman i could not have believed in either just then it was neither what then a human hand large and shapely appeared distinctly on the surface of the pond nothing more not even the wrist to which it might be attached it did not beckon or indeed move at all it was as still as the hand of death i stood motionless and watched while the outline of the hand became more clear then i gave an awful shudder the hand was red i gave a shriek and for a time remembered nothing more i awoke to consciousness fighting at first it seemed as if i was fighting with the phantom but gradually my opponent became more real to me it was kaffir I had only a dim, hazy idea of what I was doing, except that I sought to wrest from his hand a knife. We clutched at each other savagely and wrestled there on the edge of the pond. Weights seemed to hang upon my limbs, but I felt the stronger of the two. Gradually, I knew I was mastering him. Then all was blank. A sound of voices, a flash of light, a feeling of freedom, and I was awake where still by drearwater pond no phantoms no shadow nothing unreal save the memory of that which i have but dimly described that was but a terrible nightmare an awful dream where was kaffir i could not tell certainly he was not near but two other forms stood near me one bearing a lantern is that you justin said a voice it is i tom I said, looking vacantly around. And where is Kaffir? said another voice, which I recognized as Voltaire's. Kaffir? I... I don't know. But you have been together. Have we? I said, vacantly. You know you have. What is that in your hand? I had scarcely known what I had been saying or doing up to this time, but as he spoke, I looked at my hand. In the light of the moon I saw a knife, red with blood, and my hand, too, was also discolored. "'What does this mean?' cried Voltaire. "'I do not know. I am dazed, bewildered. But that is Kaffir's knife. I know he had it this very evening. Where is Kaffir now?' "'It is true,' I remembered saying. "'Have we been together?' "'That's his knife, at any rate. And what is this?' Voltaire picked up something from the ground and looked at it. Kaffirs, he said. Look, Mr. Blake, do you recognize this? I looked and saw a finely worked neckcloth, on which was written in Arabic characters the word Abba Wadi Kaffir, which had every appearance of being soiled by severe wrenching, and on it were spots of blood my faculties were rapidly returning to me yet i stood as one in a dream you say mr justin blake that you do not know where kaffir is yet you hold in your hand his knife which is red with blood here is his scarf which has evidently been strained and on it are spots of blood while all around are marks indicating a struggle i say you do know what this means and you must tell us I reeled under this terrible shock. What have I done? Could it have been that I murdered this man? Had I? Had I? I do not know what this means, I said. I think I am ill. Men usually are when they have done what you have, he said. Why, what have I done? I said in a dazed kind of way. 
done he repeated you know best about that in spite of the part you play nevertheless kaffir has not gone without leaving a friend behind him and you will have to show how you came by that pointing to the knife which i had dropped with a shudder this holding up the net cloth you must explain these marks pointing to footmarks near the water's edge besides which you will have to produce my friend a terrible thought flashed into my mind i had again been acting under the influence of this man's power by some means he had made me the slave of his will and i had unknowingly killed kaffir and he like the fiend that he was had come to sweep me out of his road perchance too kaffir's death might serve him in good stead undoubtedly the egyptian knew too much for vulture and so i was made a tool whereby he could be freed from troublesome obstacles the idea maddened me i would proclaim the story to every one if i were hanged i cared not i opened my mouth to tell tom the whole truth but i could not utter a word my tongue refused to articulate my power of speech left me my position was too terrible my overwrought nerves yielded at last i felt my head whirling around while streams of icy water seemed to be running down my legs then i fell down at tom temple's feet for some time after that i remembered nothing distinctly i have some idea of stumbling along with tom on one side of me and vulture on the other but no word was spoken until we came to temple hall then i heard tom say he's better now you go into the drawing-room as if nothing had happened and i'll take him quietly upstairs to bed i entered the silent house like one in a dream and went with tom to my bedroom where i undressed like a weary child and soon sunk into a deep dreamless sleep End of chapter eleven of, of weapons of mystery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org weapons of mystery by joseph hocking chapter twelve a midnight conference someone was knocking at the door who's there tom temple i sprang out of bed and let him in he looked very grave and very worried instantly everything flashed through my mind in relation to our terrible meeting of the night before it's nine o'clock justin yes tom i suppose it must be i said confusedly but i've only just awoke i thought i must come i want to talk with you thank you tom i'm glad you've come how are you this morning is your mind clear fairly why i must have some conversation with you about last night everything is confusion i can explain nothing neither can i he looked at me keenly and sighed were you with kaffar last night after he had so abominably insulted you and left the house i don't know do you know where he is now no no idea whatever not the slightest justin my friend this looks very strange everything is terribly black terribly suspicious I tried to tell him all that I knew, tried to tell him of my mad passion and the scenes through which I seemed to go, but I could not. My mind refused to think, my tongue refused to speak, when that was the subject. I suppose Voltaire has told everyone the circumstances of last night, I said at length. No. No one? No one will divulge anything. Everyone else thinks that Kaffar has gone back to Egypt, as he said and especially so as voltaire has been making arrangements for his luggage to be sent to cairo this is astounding i do not comprehend him the least but tell me who is this someone to whom you or he has related last night's affair and why was it done i don't know whether i ought to tell you or not but you're an old friend and i can't refuse after i'd come down from here last night and fancying that everyone had retired for it was quite midnight i knowing i was too excited to sleep made my way to the library i had just reached the door when i heard voices i wondered who could be up at that time of night but was not left to remain long in doubt 
Mr. Voltaire, said a voice. You've been out looking for Mr. Blake. Have you found him? Mr. Blake is safe in bed before this, Miss Forrest. Probably asleep, was his reply. Miss Forrest, I cried. Did she go to him? Evidently, replied Tom. Indeed, I found out afterwards that she had been very anxious. She had seen you go out and watched Voltaire and me, who went in search of you, and would not retire until she knew your whereabouts. Well, what then? I went into the room. I couldn't stand and play the eavesdropper. Miss Forrest seemed very glad to see me, and said eagerly, I came down to ask whether you had found Mr. Blake. I'm glad he's safe. And he must remain safe, cried Voltaire. Why? asked Miss Forrest. Miss Forrest cried Voltaire vehemently. You have been deprived of your rest tonight in order to know about one who is guilty of what you English people call a foul crime, but which I call a deed that must be avenged. I do not understand you. Ah, Miss Forrest, we Easterns are not like you English people. You are cool and considerate. We are warm and impulsive. Gaffar was not one that could be loved by you cold people, but I loved him. We were more than brothers. I know he was faulty. I know he dared the anger of your English giant, but I did not think it would come to this. Come to what? she asked eagerly. Voltaire, I said, is this quite fair? No, no, he cried, but I am so excited that I can scarcely master myself. I will say no more. Come to what? repeated Miss Forrest. I will not say, replied Voltaire. I will not wound your tender nature. I will not tell you a tale of villainy. I will not cause a ripple on the even stream of your life. Retire to rest, sweet lady, and think that what I have said is a dream. Villainy, cried she. Tell me what it is. Yes, there is villainy, I think. I will be answered. Tell me the truth. Even Voltaire was cowed by her words. He stood and looked at her for a minute, as if in doubt what to do. Then he burst out passionately. Yes, I will answer you. I will tell you now what all the world must know tomorrow. I had hoped to spare your feelings, but the tone of your demand makes me speak. He has no proof for what he is going to say, I said. Proof, cried Voltaire. There is sufficient proof for an English court of law, and that law is terribly hard on murderers. Murderers, cried Miss Forrest. What do you mean? This, cried Voltaire. You saw Kaffar challenge Mr. Blake in the drawing-room. I saw him insult Mr. Blake. I saw that Mr. Blake refrained from crushing him beneath his heel like a reptile. I saw that, she cried excitedly. Just so, said Voltaire. Then Kaffar went out, and Mr. Blake went after him. After him? Where? Mr. Temple and I did not like the look on his face, and we followed him. I traced his footsteps along the high road for a long while, and then we lost sight of them. We knew not where to go, when Mr. Temple thought he heard voices away in the distance. We went in the direction of the sound, and came to Drearwater Pond. Drearwater Pond? That terrible place to which we rode the other day? The same, gentle lady. And then? When we came there we found Mr. Blake in a reclining position with a bloody knife in his hand. I recognized it as belonging to Kaffar. I saw something lying on the ground, and on picking it up found it to be a scarf which Kaffar had been wearing this very night. It was twisted and soiled, and on it were spots of blood. Footmarks were to be seen on the edge of the deep pond, indicating a struggle, but Kaffar was nowhere to be seen. It cannot be. It cannot be, said Miss Forrest. But what then? I asked Mr. Blake questions. I accused him of many things, but he denied nothing. Denied nothing? Nothing, Miss Forrest. He tacitly admitted everything. I wish I could think otherwise, but, oh, I am afraid my friend, my only friend, lies murdered at the bottom of Drillwater Pond, and murdered by Mr. Blake. It cannot be, cried Miss Forrest. Mr. Blake could never, never do so. There is some mistake. He took something from his pocket, which was wrapped in a handkerchief. He removed this wrapping, and there revealed the knife you held in your hand. This blood cries out for vengeance, he said. Aye, and it shall be avenged, too. She gave a scream as if in pain. Why, what will you do, she cried. Were I in Egypt, 
my vengeance would be speedy he said his light eyes glittering but i am debarred from that here still there is a means of vengeance your english law is stern tomorrow the whole country shall shudder because of this dark deed and tomorrow night that man justin blake shall sleep in a felon's cell no no she cried not that have mercy yes yes he said his voice husky with passion what mercy did he have upon my friend i will have vengeance and my vengeance is just try as i might i could not help shuddering at this a felon cell my name mentioned with loathing twas too horrible i tried to conquer myself however and to tell tom to go on with his recital he continued does any one know of these things besides you two she said at length no replied voltaire no one has had a chance of knowing tom stopped in his recital as if he would rather not tell what followed what next tom i cried eagerly i am thinking whether it's fair to her to tell you and yet it is right you should know what was it tom she threw herself down on her knees before us and besought us to keep the matter in our own hearts it's not true she cried mr blake would never do such a thing there is some mistake promise me no word shall be uttered as to this mr kaffar has left as he said and gone back to egypt why then should such a terrible suspicion be aroused i will answer for mr blake's innocence your answer miss forrest cried voltaire nay you cannot i would i could be merciful but it must not be my friend's spirit would haunt me from town to town and land to land mr temple she cried to me you will not tell will you you will not spread such a deceptive story about no i replied i will not like you i think there must be a mistake my friend justin could never do this there she cried to voltaire there's only you to be silent do it for my sake i could not help feeling a great throb of joy in my heart at this i was sure now that she loved me i could bear anything after hearing those words i was happy in spite of the terrible net that was woven around me for your sake said voltaire for your sake i could do almost anything for your sake i could give up home friends happiness life yes i say this here in the presence of my friend temple i could forego anything for you i would sacrifice father and mother for you i gave a great start just then that man trembled like a leaf his face became ashly pale his terrible eyes became brighter than ever you ask me much he continued you ask me to give up what is now the dearest object of my life except one but ah i am an eastern i am selfish i cannot sacrifice disinterestedly there is only one thing for which i can give up my scheme of vengeance tell me what it is she cried ah sweet lady i dare not tell and yet i must it is you be my wife miss forrest let me call you by your name and i will wipe the blood from this knife i will destroy every evidence of the dark deed justin blake shall not lie in a prison cell his name shall not be a synonym for deviltry he shall not be mentioned with loathing and what then i cried what was her answer man she looked at him with loathing but he did not see it be your wife she said my wife miss forrest he replied love cannot be greater than mine i love the very ground on which you walk be my wife and i will be your slave your every desire shall be granted and i will give up that which is dear to me and if i will not she said ah if you will not then ah i am an eastern and cannot give up everything if i cannot have love i must have vengeance but you have made a mistake your friend is alive it's absurd to think that mr blake is guilty of such a deed he pointed with a trembling hand to the bloody knife i can have no stronger proof than that he said and that blood cries out for vengeance now oh i cannot she said i cannot you refuse me he said quietly i must i must she cried it cannot be he went to the writing desk that stood near by and commenced writing if a poor eastern cannot have love he can still have vengeance he said what are you writing she cried i'm writing a letter to the superintendent of the nearest police station telling him to come with some men to temple hall to arrest a murderer 
Have you no mercy, she said? Mercy, lady, only the great spirit above knows what I have made up my mind to give up, when I told you the condition on which I would be silent. I loved my friend as Jonathan loved David, and he is dead, murdered by an enemy's hand. Vengeance is one of the sweetest thoughts to an Eastern, and I meant to be avenged. You begged for his life, and I offered it for your love. I asked you to marry me, me who would give up everything for you, but you refused. I grieve for you, lady, but since I cannot have love, I must have revenge. He went on writing, while Miss Forrest clasped her hands as if in prayer. I am relating this very badly, Justin. I cannot remember many of the things that were said. I cannot call to mind all the gestures, the tones of voice, or the awful anguish which seemed to possess them both. I can only give you a scrappy account of what passed. I remember Tom's powers of memory, however, for which he had always been remarkable at school, and I knew that the account he gave me was not far from correct, and I begged him to go on. At length she turned to him again, continued Tom. I'm going to show, she said, that I believe Mr. Blake innocent. You asked me for love. That I cannot give you. I do not love you. I shall never love you. But such is my belief in Mr. Blake's innocence that I promise you this. If he is not proved to be guiltless within a year, I will marry you. He leaped to his feet as if to embrace her. No, she said. You've not heard all my conditions. Within that year you are not to see me or communicate with me. But, he cried, if Kaffar is dead, if these terrible evidences of murder are real, then in a year, say next Christmas Eve, "'Twas on Christmas Eve we first met in England. "'Then you will promise to be my wife? "'I promise. "'And your promise shall be irrevocable?' "'She turned on him with scorn. "'The promise of a lady is ever irrevocable,' she said. "'Ah!' cried Voltaire. "'Love is a stronger passion than vengeance, "'and my love will win yours.' "'Meanwhile she went on without noticing this rhapsody. "'If you breathe one word, or utter one sound by which suspicion can fall on Mr. Blake. My promise is forfeited. If you stay here after tomorrow, or attempt to see me within this and next Christmas Eve, my promise is also forfeited. What? Am I to leave you at once? At once. He left the room immediately after, said Tom, while after saying good night to me. She too retired to her bedroom. To say that I was astonished at the turn things had taken would not give the slightest idea of my feelings, and yet a great joy filled my heart. The sword of Damocles, which seemed to hang over my head, possessed no terror. Is that all, Tom? I said at length. This morning, as I told you, he arranged for Kaffar's luggage to be sent to Egypt, while he himself is preparing to depart. Where is he going? To London. And Miss Forrest? She, I hope, will stay with us for some time. But, Justin, can you really give me no explanation of these things? Surely you must be able to. I cannot, Tom. I am hedged in on every side. I am enslaved, and I cannot tell you how. My life is a mystery, and at times a terror. But do you know what has become of Kaffar? No more than that dog barking in the yard. All is dark to me. Tom left me then, while I, with my poor, tired brain, tried to think what to do. End of chapter 12